Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 490, Fireman Moment. This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I hope you are well. I have a jam-packed show for you today. But the first thing I wanted to tell you was I had a total fireman moment this week. A friend, her husband had thought that he had gotten all the birds out of a hole in their wall, up in their attic, and didn't. But he'd already screwed a plate in over the hole, and then my friend found that she could hear baby birds trying to get out. So she had the kids at home, she was by herself, she didn't want to climb up the very tall ladder on her own, and I volunteered to run over and go do it. So I got to climb up a really tall ladder, and go and unscrew a panel, and then we stood there and watched the mama bird feed her kids over and over and over. I didn't realize birds could find food that quickly. It was really impressive, actually. But baby birds are fine, happy, and healthy. Mama bird is calm, everybody's great, and they're just going to wait until the baby birds grow up enough to fly away, and then they'll close the hole up again. But I thought it was kind of fun having my own legit fireman moment when Fahrenheit 451 has just come out on HBO. And it's, it's not perfect, but that's a really, really hard story to do now. I thought that the changes that they made were smart. It was very tricky. The casting, excellent. At this point, I think I would probably watch Michael B. Jordan read the phone book and be perfectly happy about it. But I actually felt like it needed more, like more world building. Actually, I kind of thought that if they had merged Fahrenheit 451 with the world that The Handmaid's Tale takes place in, it would be pretty perfect and really, really scary. As it is, it's disturbing enough, but if you haven't read the book before, you might want to watch this first and then go back and read the book. It might be kind of an interesting way to do it, to get the more modern version And then kind of take yourself back to when Ray Bradbury wrote the original and see the connections that way. And you know I don't say that very often. But especially if you're a a young'un, a whippersnapper, uh, it might make more sense to, to watch the filmed version first. Plus, they did a great job with their technology, I thought. So, firemen all around. And then as I got to thinking about the, the world of Fahrenheit 451 and all of the things that are happening in that world, I was listening to my kids talk about a particular YouTuber who they really like, and they started showing me some of his videos. And so I am sharing a boatload of videos with you on the show notes at craftlit.com slash 490, 490. There's this guy. His YouTuber name is Captain Disillusion, and he is very cheeseball old school weekday afternoon TV kind of guy. And his whole, his whole presentational style is very circa early 1990s stuff. It's cheesy. He actually gets Beekman from Beekman's World to come on his YouTube channel and film a couple videos with him. It's that era. I loved watching Beekman with my kids. So Captain Disillusion is kind of our current version, but he does some very specific, very, very useful things because his whole MO is that he wants to debunk visual lies. He is actually a VFX, a a video uh, special effects guy. That's what he does. And so he is, now he's well known enough that people will send him requests. Like, can you look at this video that I saw and tell me if it's true or not? And not only will he tell you, but it takes him about a month, maybe six weeks to make a video because he goes through and shows you how it's done. Really remarkable things like, Uh, There are these advertisements and YouTubers that are out there that are 
it looks like they're slinging measuring tapes, the metal tapes, and kind of slinging them underhand and hooking them on a door and then pulling the door open. And not only does he show you how they faked it, but he shows you when they don't fake it. He has a whole thing, which I've linked to, called The Definitive Guide to Trick Shots. And he shows you how to do a fake trick shot. And then he shows you the YouTubers who aren't faking it. So he, he gives you the tools that you need to be able to recognize a fake when you see it and to know who you can trust when you see it as well. And if you aren't like me, somebody who normally loves seeing behind the curtain, I love seeing how they do special effects in TV and film. I find it just as magical as believing the effect it, itself in the first place. There's also a video that you might want to watch first from a, a guy who has a channel called What It Is and then a series on that channel called Why It Works. And he has a Why It Works, the Captain Disillusion debunk. And he does a pretty good job of explaining that whereas most debunkery that goes on on YouTube can get pretty snarky, Captain Disillusion, because of his goofy demeanor and his, his kind of goofy loser demeanor, he doesn't come across as successfully snarky. He's just right and smart. And when he gets into the actual explanation, it's no longer a judgment. It is just, isn't this cool? And, and it does work. So I've got a whole bunch of videos linked out for you from the show notes. You can go and see. One of the really interesting ones, I thought, was the Russian ghost car debunk. Because Captain Disillusion himself grew up speaking one or two, several Slavic languages. So he can actually hear and understand what the people are saying in the car when they see the ghost car. And the, the math that's involved, the geometry, the sight lines, the different things to look for, it's just fascinating. And he, he also debunks a video that I, shame on you weather channel, saw on the weather channel video feed about a month ago. They were showing it like it was real. And he debunked it a year ago. So that's the UFO over India video. And I, I also linked out to that one too. Anyway, that's Captain Disillusion and a lot of fun. And uh, his videos are, are safe for kids. Some of the people that he parodies in this one video, uh, who I also linked out to, some of their stuff is not so much safe for kids. So you might want to preview it before you show it to any unsuspecting innocents in your life or in your way. <laughs> so that's that. I also wanted to thank you. Those of you who were on Facebook saw me post a Kiva donations opportunity. If you don't know about Kiva, it's a way that you can, say, put 20 bucks in your account on Kiva, and then you can decide who you want to donate that money to as a loan. So people from all over the world put up things like, I want to start a business. This is what I need to do. These are my plans. Here's the amount of money that I think I'll need. You donate money to them as a loan. And then once they get enough money to be able to start the business and start making money themselves, they pay that loan back to you. Once it's paid back to you, you can then take your money and loan it to somebody else. And it's a really great kind of pay it forward system. I've loaned money several times now, and the woman who I funded this week was starting a stitchery business. She was teaching people how to make their living doing stitchery, kind of the, the teach a man to fish thing, except with stitching. So I thought that would be a good one. Anyway, the link is in the show notes if you too would like to donate, but they, they had a push. This was a week that they were trying to expand their reach, and they did better than they could possibly have imagined they did. So thank you very much. I also have a bunch of emails and voicemails for you today. So I'm going to start with the emails first. And our first one comes from Anna G. And Anna writes, I just wanted to send in a quick word about Anne of Green Gables. I didn't really have any historical insight, just a few thoughts. In Wives and Daughters, I remember Cynthia only 15 or 16 at the time, puts up her hair for the party with Mr. Preston. And Laura Ingalls Wilder, before she is Wilder, begins to wear a bun, like sometime circa Little House on the Prairie, instead of braids as she matures. It's interesting that Mr. Brocklehurst disallows the young girls to wear their hair down, even in plates, perhaps to stifle their childhood. 
as well as their vanity. I know at some point only married or much older women would wear their hair up. In fact, it was inappropriate for older women to wear their hair down in public. Although my grandmother always had very short hair, she currently holds to the opinion that young girls should wear their hair down. She used to tell my mother not to let me wear my hair up. She said it made me look like I was 15. I'd never thought about it until now, but I guess even till the 1960s, girls still waited until they were older or married to wear their hair up. I wonder if the sexual revolution had anything to do with that cultural shift. And about adding blues to whites, that's something I do in my oil portraits. I'm not sure why, but the best way to make whites look more realistic is to add blue. Anyway, I just wanted to throw in my two cents. Thanks for the great show. Definitely something to look forward to every week. Anna G. Yay! Oh, I'm so glad you're enjoying it. And thank you for the information. Yes, I seem to recall there being discussions about hair being up or down. And, uh, and that it definitely was attached to age in my world as well. Next, we have an email from Gabrielle, who is violin knitter on Ravelry. She writes, I just had to write in about the elocution concert that Anne attended. Marion Wilson Kimber, who is a musicology or music history professor at the University of Iowa, wrote an entire book about elocution and elocution recitals, similar to the one that Anne attended. What's more fun is that she was doing research for the book during the time that I was finishing my thesis under her watchful eye, so I got to hear about some of her exciting findings as they happened. Anyway, the book is called The Elocutionists, Women, Music, and the Spoken Word, and I've linked out to that. What's funny is that just days after the podcast where you talked about Prissy Andrews and the slimy stare, Wilson Kimber reposted this from the Detroit Library on her Tumblr, and it is comments on the curfew must not ring tonight. And she says, apparently the phrase slimy stare was absolutely one of the published variants of the curfew must not ring tonight. Prissy Andrews did not make a mistake. And then she put in parentheses, loathe as I am to say anything nice about Prissy. <laughs> yes, I know. I almost didn't read that part of the comment because I didn't want to give her any credit, but, but I have to be fair. Then she says, for more elocutionary fun, check out this video of Wilson Kimber doing a live accompanied performance of A Lesson with the Fan. There is a gif of this performance floating around certain musicological corners of Twitter. Or, if you prefer, there is a gif of this performance floating around certain musicological, musicological corners of Twitter. So I have linked out to both the Tumblr and to the YouTube video, and to a YouTube video of how you are supposed to pronounce gif, 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 gif. <laughs> so you can find out what the real way is according to the man who invented the term. All right, next we have email from Diane G. She's been catching up and said, I have a couple of tangential comments late in the game. First, about Prince Edward Island and the Red Roads. I unexpectedly ended up on Prince Edward Island last summer. And then she said, oh my God, how come I got to be 73 without seeing how awesome it is? The heritage roads aren't the only thing in Prince Edward Island that is red. Everything is. Fields, roadsides, beaches, any light-colored fabric that comes into contact with the red rock or its weathered sandstone product. My pictures don't show it well, but this government site has a great photo of red rock cliffs and the sand that they weathered into. And so I've linked out to that from the show notes as well. The other totally unrelated comment is about kiviet. Indeed, kiviet is traditionally plucked from fences and bushes, but at the musk ox farm near Palmer, Alaska, and probably others, they comb the musk oxen. The animals are not considered domesticated, or domesticatable, I suppose, but because these are hand-raised, <laughs> raised by hand, and accustomed to human contact from birth, they allow themselves to be placed for safety in stanchions and combed for their fiber. And I found a video, and you will not believe how much kiviet comes off these beasties. It's amazing to watch. Then she wrote, just notice that this is actually commentary from both sides of the continent. And yes, I've driven to both. Why stay home when there's so much cool stuff to see and when one can have such good craftlet company? And you know I am a fan of driving across the country listening to awesome audio. Then Diane adds, when Marilla goes to Charlottetown, 
for the political rally in Chapter 18. The location is significant for several reasons. It is, of course, the closest town to Avonlea, and it is still today the largest town on the island. More importantly, Charlottetown is sort of Canada's Boston, and it's a huge tourist draw today. And of course, Avonlea isn't a real place. Charlottetown is. Avonlea is the stand-in for the town that Lucy Maud Montgomery grew up in. So Diane goes on, the Charlottetown Conference in 1864 led to the birth of Canada as a nation. On July 1st, 1867, this is considerably before our book takes place, the Confederation of British Colonies, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Canada, were joined to form the Dominion of Canada. The former colony of Canada was split at the time to form Ontario and Quebec. So there were originally four provinces in the Confederation. The Dominion of Canada, which celebrated its 150th anniversary in 2017, now has 10 provinces and three territories. They actually have equivalent political status. The difference comes from how they were granted their political power. Prince Edward Island, which, as near as I can figure, must have also been a British colony, didn't join the Confederation until 1875, but still long before Lucy and slash Anne's births. So, a little bit of interesting extra information there. Then I got an email from Robin in Texas, and she said, I found you some links for proper pinned aprons. During the Civil War, they were called pinners. Women have been pinning things to clothing since the Viking era. During the 14th century, they would even pin their sleeves and would use pins to attach their coifs to a band, like a headband, to hold it on their head. Generally, pins were short and not as sharp as pins now. Also, the direction you pinned it in mattered. Since Roman times, there's also a type of safety pin called a fibula, but those tended to be bulkier and were used more for fastening capes or jackets. Which, duh, now I remember seeing in my costume class. Uh, she said, I will attach some photos of aprons that were pinned to the dresses. Note the head of the pin would be towards your armpit, and the pointy part would be pointing inward towards your breastbone so you would be li less likely to poke or scratch yourself. And I've taken the, the images that she sent links to, and those are also on the show notes at craftlit.com slash 490. I don't know of any time period where women were sewn into their dresses daily. Generally, that was only if the fastenings of the dress were unfinished by the time it needed to be worn, and the woman wouldn't be wealthy enough to have a seamstress on hand while she was dressing. Most common women would not have servants to sew them into their clothing and needed clothing they could put on by themselves. Also, Hooks and eyes have been around for quite a long time as a fastener alternative to lacing or buttons. It is a modern myth that women always needed a servant to help dress themselves, as most reenactors can prove this to be false. There are videos of how women dress themselves, including lacing their own corsets quite easily, if the corset is properly laced. Of course, if you have someone help you, that's always nice too. For lots of informative videos about dressing and fashions of a variety of time periods, see prior attire and We've linked out to that as well. I remember now that when I saw this being sewn into a dress, it wasn't so much being sewn into the dress. It was having a stomacher sewn to the bodice. And I don't remember if it was movie or TV show or a reenactment, so it very well could have been that they just didn't have everything done yet. But I did remember while I was reading this, the stomacher is a, it wasn't something that was used forever. It was for a particular fashion, and it was a flat, kind of a triangular piece that you would wear down right over your breastbone, down to your stomach, stomacher, and it would make your stomach flat. It was like a board that was covered in fabric, and that was the piece that I remember seeing sewn on. So thank you, Robin, for all the details and the links and the pictures. That's awesome. And lastly, I got an email from Christina. She said she just found this on Reddit and asks, did I know that it was so popular, Anne of Green Gables was so popular in Poland? And the answer is no. Get this. Anne of Green Gables became so popular and such an important symbol of freedom in Poland that the Polish army issued a copy to every soldier right before World War II started. How cool is that? Go, Anne. That's pretty awesome. So yeah, cool stuff. Go, Anne. Now, we also had a lot of people call in this week, or over the last two weeks, from all over the place. They called area code 206-350-1642. All right, our first voicemail comes from Amy. And just so you know, 
she mentions a podcast. I've put a link to that podcast in the show notes, so you'll be able to find that. And I'm going to let her play straight into the next voicemail. Hi, Heather. This is Amy. Amy crochets on Ravelry with an A-I-M-E. Um, I'm calling with a couple of things. I thought you might like a little more information on the sugar water for babies. And this is a layperson. I'm not an expert. But when my thing, too, was born back in 2003, he was taken to the NICU really soon after his birth, which didn't freak me out because his brother had lived in the NICU for a couple of months and everything was fine. But what freaked me out was, you know, in the age of Internet, we see all these things that we should and shouldn't let the hospitals do with our babies. And one of them that I had read was, don't let them give your baby sugar water because it will do, you know, get them addicted to sugar or make them unable to latch later or whatever. But what the doctor explained to me is he had low blood sugar and he had to be given sugar water because they had seen through research and through things in the past that babies who have low blood sugar at birth that isn't corrected have neurological or learning disabilities later in life. So they wanted to get him to the NICU and monitor his blood sugar and give him enough sugar water to get it where it needed to be to prevent any brain damage. So I thought that was fascinating, and I was like, yeah, take him, go. Um, And he's, of course, obviously fine now, and he's a freshman in high school and doing just great. And so I'm – and he had no problems latching or having a regular uh, diet after that. So thought that was an interesting – addition to the sugar water conversation. Additionally, when you were talking about ironing and slick stones and all of that, I was reminded one of the things I love about Craftlet is I think I've found my people in that we like learning new and interesting things. So in that vein, uh, if you're not listening to the Ear Hustle podcast, which is a podcast done from within San Quentin prison by a, an inmate and a volunteer, it's phenomenal. It's in its second season, and it's just such a good podcast. But they did a an episode recently called The Workaround, which is about how inmates uh, take care of themselves, like their appearances and everything. And there's a really interesting piece in there from a man who talks about how he irons his clothes without waiting in line for the one iron they have in their area. And I thought you guys would find that really interesting. So go check out Your Hustle and the episode called The Workaround. And I am loving, loving, loving Amy Green Gables. And keep up the good work, Heather. We really appreciate you. Also, I feel you. My oldest is graduating from high school next month, and it is crazy time. So good luck with all of that. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Hi, Heather. This is Maxine in Wisconsin. First of all, I've been really enjoying Kim, Kim's interpretation of Anne of Green Gables, and thank you for finding her or for her volunteering because it's been wonderful. Um, some comments on Chapter 20. Personally, I thought it was funny. Um, one of the things that came to mind was the haunted wood and Anne and Diana making up all the stories about the hauntings and everything, which is quite similar to Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Ichabod Crane at Ben Tassel's party, listening to all the horror stories and the ghost stories and everything, and then taking that scary, scary walk or ride home afterwards. And as far as Anne remembering the date, the anniversary of her being adopted by the Cuthberts and Marilla not remembering, I think part of it is Anne is finally wanted. Someone finally adopted her and not to be useful. So, of course, she's going to remember the date. But Marilla is, unfortunately, a bit like Anne's previous foster parents in that it was a business transaction, not this maternal thing that she wanted a daughter. Her and Matthew wanted a boy to help out on the farm. So, of course, Marilla is not going to remember that date. However, because... Anne has such a big personality and that it's, she always, Anne was always there. She knows internally that she didn't have her as a baby, but because of Anne's big personality, she's just chronologically challenged and can imagine the time that Anne wasn't there. So just a few thoughts on that. 
Again, I've been really enjoying the interpretation that Kim gives. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the next chapter. Bye. So I totally agree, Maxine. Yes, Sleepy Hollow. And in fact, we did Sleepy Hollow a thousand years ago. It was the first year. It was the first Halloween Craftlet ever did. And now that audio lives as a cleaned up version in a Halloween bundle. And I've put a link to that bundle in the show notes for this episode. So if anybody wants to listen to the real Sleepy Hollow and see exactly what Maxine is talking about, you have access to the audio there. All right, here we have an important PSA from Lee's. Hi, Heather. This is Lise. I'm commenting on um, not this week's episode, but last week's episode, because I'm a week behind listening. Um, we're in the beginning where you are talking about Infinity Wars and being surprised at how dark it got and how much they went there and the themes expressed and how this didn't match up with your image of, uh, I think you said the comics. And not just the Marvel comic movies. If you if you said the Marvel comic movies, I apologize. But um, just want to say that comic books are a huge and varied medium, and even within the genre comics of superheroes, there's a lot of literature. There are a lot. Um, there are a number of, of writers who started off in that medium and, and moved on to. Um, to more conventional literature. Neil Gaiman comes to mind immediately, but there are a number of them. Um, there's a lot of depth. There's a lot of subjects that are handled very well, very poorly, a lot of emotion, a lot of really great themes. So, um, yeah, it's it's not actually that surprising. This is – The Infinity Wars is an adaptation of a huge storyline that took place I think over a couple of years, over many, many, many comic book titles. Um, it was a, a huge, big thing. And um, according to my husband, who got very much into it at the time, it's not that untrue a um, representation of or, or a, a translation of a lot of what happened in the comic books to the movies, as far as the themes are concerned, as far as what's happening. Although, he will go off on spot line issues uh, ad nauseum. But, um, yeah, no, it's it's one of those areas of genre fiction where it's fiction. Genre or not, good, bad, deep, shallow, it all shows up um, anywhere in there. And I just wanted to, to state that because um, that's one of those things that shouldn't necessarily be a surprise. Uh, that's it. Bye-bye. So, Lise, I didn't have time to go back and listen to that episode, but if I left anyone with the impression, as I clearly did, that I thought that it was out of character for comic books to deal with kind of darker, existential, real questions of light and dark, good and evil, and all of that, I did not mean to imply that at all. And in fact, I put a link to my very first graphic novel that I ever purchased myself, which was a, a Dark Knight graphic novel called The Killing Joke. And it's about the Joker. And it is about as dark as you can get without turning out all the lights. It's really, really good. But my, my actual entree into more modern post-Alan Moore, probably, it's really clear that these are storylines that can grapple with really complex and often dark, as well as funny, but dark sides of human nature and what it means to be human and what it means to be good. And can you be good if you have to do bad things in order to try and make things better? I mean, these are really important things for kids to wrestle with and adults. I think what I was so surprised by was that the movie franchise, which has been especially if you look at Thor Ragnarok, it's fun. There's a lot of laughs in Thor Ragnarok. There, were, there are a lot of laughs anytime Tony Stark is on the screen, usually. What I was surprised by was how dark the latest Avengers, the Infinity Wars, got and how dark the cliffhanger was. They didn't have to stop it there. There were several places where they could have stopped it that would have been lighter, and they didn't. 
And it surprised me because it's a long time until the follow-up comes out. So for me, I was surprised they took the risk. Not unhappy, just surprised. But yes, don't let me accidentally or purposefully mislead anyone into thinking that, that comic books are all lightweight, pulpy, devoid of thought pieces of text. They're really quite good and very useful when you have kids who have a hard time following text because their eyes have more to look at on the page and they're getting visual literacy as well as word and letter literacy. And that's worth something. Especially in this world, there's a lot of visual stuff that's coming at them. The more they can identify things visually, the better off they are. All right, now we have two more voicemails, one from Michelle, and I'm going to let her play straight into Gaylene. So here we go. Hi, Heather. My name is Michelle, baking knitter on Ravelry basically everywhere. I just keep thinking about the take notice list. It is mentioned in Anne of Green Gables. And knowing the time period and the morality of the time, what I keep wondering is if the take notice list wasn't of children in school who they believed were starting to date, court, or just have crushes on one another. The idea being to make the children of the school, as much as the adults of the area, keep an eye on the prospective couple to make sure that they maintained the level of decorum that would have been expected of them, which is why Diana Berry would have said she would have been horrified to have her name on the take notice list because it would have meant he liked a boy or a boy liked her. Just my two cents and something I've been thinking about ever since it was mentioned. I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye. Hi, Heather. This is Gaylene, quotidian knitter on Ravelry. I'm really enjoying Anne of Green Gables. I think it's a perfect book for, to listen to in the spring and summer. The reader is wonderful. I didn't think anyone could do Marilla Cuthbert as well as Colleen Dewhurst. But Kim, Kim Zuckert is doing a great job getting across Marilla's dry humor and practical yet reservedly warm personality. I'm calling to comment on something that caught my ear in Episode 487, Chapter 18, when Anne saved Diana's baby sister, Minnie Mae, and thus returned to the good graces of Mrs. Berry. Minnie Mae was suffering from the croup, and Anne saved her with repeated doses of syrup of Ipecac throughout the long, anxious night. We played a clip of a child coughing in that distinctive, barky way that gets a parent's attention, and sure enough, it gave me chills, because even though my children haven't suffered from the croup for years, it's not an experience parent wants to repeat. What got me curious was Anne's use of Ipecac, which is an emetic, vomit-inducing. Croup, as we know it, is usually due to a viral respiratory infection and often doesn't even have mucus associated with it. Now, when a child has croup, we tend to haul out the humidifier to soothe and relax those tight, swollen airways. Why on earth would you want to make a child throw up who's already struggling to breathe? It would just seem to increase the chance that a child would aspirate the vomit and make the situation even worse. So I went poking around on the Internet, and I found a blog by a blog post by a doctor who was asked, asked that very question by her daughter when they were reading the book. Dr. Catherine Ottaway, who practices and blogs in rural Washington state, thinks that Minnie Mae was actually suffering from diphtheria, not what we call croup now. Diphtheria is a serious bacterial infection, which causes cells in the airways to die and build up in a thick gray membrane of dead cells in the throat and nose, which causes that barking, croupy cough. The buildup of that mucousy dead cell stuff blocks the airways and can result in suffocation. So when Anne, based on her experience in caring for the six Hammond children, dosed little Minnie Mae with Ipecac, the child's vomit could clear the diphtheria membrane out of her throat and make breathing a little easier for just a while. Anne's diligent administration of Ipecac got Minnie Mae through the night and her fever and symptoms eased. It's rugged, desperate medicine. But according to Dr. Ottaway, it could help, and it probably was an accepted method for dealing with this diphtheria infection at the time. Of course, today, fortunate children in the developed world don't have to deal with deadly diphtheria. The D in the DTAP vaccination stands for diphtheria, and children rarely contract the disease or die from it. In other parts of the world, about 2,000 children die of diphtheria each year. But happily, those numbers are always going down because of vaccination and common antibiotics, 
which weren't available in Anne's early 20th century world. So, Dr. Ottaway's explanation to her daughter, which can be found on her blog, drkottaway.com, along with her gorgeous photos of the Pacific Northwest, makes sense to me and answers my question about the use of Ipecac. Minnie May's grateful mother can forgive Anne and allow Diana and Anne to resume their bosom friendship, and we can be thankful that we live in a world mostly without diphtheria. I hope your college business with your son has gone well, and I'm looking forward to the next installment of Anne's ebullient story. Thank you so much for Craftlet. So I'm thrilled, Gaylene, that you called in about this. Just so you know where I had gotten my stuff from, I had read several, some of it was old, and I didn't find all of them, but I did find one where it was a, a 1900 journal, and I've linked to this from the show notes along with the uh, link to Catherine Ottaway. There was a journal from 1900, and it does mention that croup and diphtheria often share similar symptoms and uh, treatments, and they do talk about using humidifiers. They even explain how to kind of tent a crib so that you can get moist air in there. And it's interesting because it has to be moist, cool air. We can now buy cool air humidifiers. Back then, they would have to open a window and boil a kettle next to the crib, letting the cool air intercept the warm, moist air as it blew into the crib, which I thought was interesting because I know I was told by our pediatrician that if the kids started to get a really horrible, barky cough, and it was nighttime, which is when this always seems to be a problem, you bundle the kid up, partially covering their face, not completely covering their face, obviously, but partially covering their face with the blanket so that the air inside the blanket stays moist, but they're getting some really, really good cold air into their lungs at the same time. And the the other explanation that I'd read was not so much that you were coughing mucus up out of their lungs, but that all of the linings of the throat were so uh, traumatized by the virus that they were overcreating mucus to try and protect the very delicate esophageal lining. It was the overproduction of mucus that in a small child could make them gag and suffocate because then they would, in fact, aspirate, uh, inhale the, the gobs of mucus that were building up in their throat, and that would be bad. And coughing didn't always bring the mucus up high enough for them to be able to spit it out. So instead, they'd bring it just high enough up in their esophagus to get above the bronchial branch, and that's when they'd aspirate it and, and die. But I did keep looking because of your voicemail. And yes, indeed, the syrup of Ipecac, if, if taken in the quantities that Anne was talking about, that's probably poisonous. At the same time, because it is enematic, that poison didn't stay in the stomach. It didn't really get ingested. And because the lining of the throat was so completely coated with mucus, it probably didn't get absorbed by the throat lining, the esophageal lining either. However, my understanding is that you can't get syrup of Ipecac anymore. So that may be just here in the States. If you can get syrup of Ipecac, I wouldn't, you know, recommend just dosing and dosing and dosing a kid with a cough. We, we certainly aren't doling out medical advice here, but there's no question. Galen's link from Catherine Ottaway is very interesting, if only to see the conversation that she has with her daughter. It's a lot of fun. So, lots of good information. All right. Way to go, listeners. All right. Things to know before Chapter 21. Number one, many of you already know this, a quilting frame is a big, detachable, deconstructable wooden frame that you can use to clamp and then hold the multiple layers of quilt. So you can hold them together while you do the actual final step of quilting. So once you have your cover, the part that's all pieced together and pretty, you have that done, you have the batting or, or whatever kind of filler you want to put in the middle that keeps you warm. And then the backing, you have to hold those suckers together flat like a giant embroidery hoop to be able to do the final quilting. So that's a quilting frame. And it is something that you could take apart into pieces and bundle together, and that would make it transportable. 
You will hear a reference to the church in Avonlea having enjoyed a variety of religious dissipation, which seems like an odd word to use when talking about religion. And it's that they had a lot of trial ministers. Dissipation usually means kind of a loss of energy or a disintegration of, of several factors. And, and so in this case, it's, it seems that Lucy Maud Montgomery is trying to communicate to us that there has been a, a rather varied level of quality coming out of these different ministers who've come and plied their trade in town. There's a line where you will hear mothers in Israel referred to, and I think it might be a joke line because it comes from the book Judges in the Bible in the Old Testament. So just listen for it. If it's a joke, it's a very little joke, but mothers in Israel kind of stands out. So I thought you should know that it came, it came from somewhere. It's chapter 5, verse 7 in the book of Judges. Just for practical reference, $750 a year was an okay salary, but it wasn't great. And that is a year, 750 bucks. Fir balsam, F-I-R. If you could get a twig that had, or, or rock or anything, and you could munch it around into fir balsam, and you got it into the water, the, the balsam, the, it's kind of the powdery residue, sticky powdery residue, it would come off in, in the water and make like this little multicolored rainbow stain on top of the water. So it'd be kind of pretty. If you are dyspeptic, you are having trouble with your digestion, an upset stomach. It's probably actually what we now call acid reflux, or it's a relative of that. But there's a, a statement about bread, new bread and old bread. And I'm hoping that someone listening knows more about this because it sounded to me like it, in, at least in theory, is something along the line of how sourdough bread is supposed to be easier for people to digest, partly because the yeast is just more mature and it's, I suppose, broken down more easily in our bodies. I'm waiting to hear from some experts on that. So if you have any comment on the new bread, old bread thing, 206-350-1642, let us know, because I'm very curious about that. You'll hear a line referencing the wisdom of the serpent. And yes, we're talking about that serpent from the Bible. That's why you need to know your Bible. And liniment. Think something like Bengay or camphophonique, something with camphor in it. It's going to smell, and you're going to be able to tell that it smells, probably from a distance. Chapter 22 notes. There is a part of a, a description of somebody being full of spirit and fire and dew, and D-E-W. This actually comes from a Robert Browning poem called Evelyn Hope, and it is the epigraph at the beginning of Anne of Green Gables. And the line that Lucy Maud Montgomery chose, it's actually two lines. The good stars met in your horoscope, made you of spirit and fire and dew. I thought that was lovely. Pale pink organdy, O-R-G-A-N-D-Y. Organdy is a cotton fabric, but unlike most cottons, it is sheer, it is see-through, and it is very crisp and kind of stands up on its own. You may have seen drapes that are made out of something that looks like organdy. Sheer drapes would be similar. And a seraph, part of the seraphim, that is the highest order of angels in heaven. And that's it. I think that's everything you need. All right, let's listen to chapters 21 and 22 of Anne of Green Gables. Read for us by Kim Zuckert. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Read by Kim Zuckert. Chapter 22. A New Departure in Flavorings Dear me, there is nothing but meetings and partings in this world, as Mrs. Lynde says, remarked Anne plaintively, putting her slate and books down on the kitchen table on the last day of June and wiping her red eyes with a very damp handkerchief. Wasn't it fortunate, Marilla, that I took an extra handkerchief to school today? I had a presentiment that it would be needed. I never thought you were so fond of Mr. Phillips that you'd require two handkerchiefs to dry your tears just because he was going away, said Marilla. I don't think I was crying because I was really so very fond of him, reflected Anne. I just cried because all the others did. 
It was Ruby Gillis started it. Ruby Gillis has always declared she hated Mr. Phillips, but just as soon as he got up to make his farewell speech, she burst into tears. Then all the girls began to cry, one after the other. I tried to hold out, Marilla. I tried to remember the time Mr. Phillips made me sit with Gil with a boy, and the time he spelled my name without an E on the blackboard, and how he said I was the worst dunce he ever saw at geometry, and laughed at my spelling, and all the times he had been so horrid and sarcastic. But somehow I couldn't, Marilla, and I just had to cry too. Jane Andrews has been talking for a month about how glad she'd be when Mr. Phillips went away, and she declared she'd never shed a tear. Well, she was worse than any of us and had to borrow a handkerchief from her brother. Of course, the boys didn't cry, because she hadn't brought one of her own, not expecting to need it. Oh, Marilla, it was heart-rending. Mr. Phillips made such a beautiful farewell speech, beginning, The time has come for us to part. It was very affecting. And he had tears in his eyes, too, Marilla. Oh, I felt dreadfully sorry and remorseful for all the times I'd talked in school and drawn pictures of him on my slate and made fun of him and Prissy. I can tell you I wished I'd been a model pupil like Minnie Andrews. She hadn't anything on her conscience. The girls cried all the way home from school. Carrie Sloan kept saying every few minutes, The time has come for us to part, and that would just start us off again whenever we were in danger of cheering up. I do feel dreadfully sad, Marilla. But one can't feel quite in the depths of despair with two months' vacation before them, can they, Marilla? And besides, we met the new minister and his wife coming from the station. For all I was feeling so bad about Mr. Phillips going away, I couldn't help taking a little interest in a new minister, could I? His wife is very pretty. Not exactly regally lovely, of course. It wouldn't do, I suppose, for a minister to have a regally lovely wife, because it might set a bad example. Mrs. Lynn said the minister's wife over at Newbridge sets a very bad example because she dresses so fashionably. Our new minister's wife was dressed in blue muslin with lovely puffed sleeves and a hat trimmed with roses. Jane Andrews said she thought puffed sleeves were too worldly for a minister's wife, but I didn't make any such uncharitable remark, Marilla, because I know what it is to long for puffed sleeves. Besides, she's only been a minister's wife for a little while, so one should make allowances, shouldn't they? They are going to board with Mrs. Lynde until the manse is ready. If Marilla, in going down to Mrs. Lynde's that evening, was actuated by any motive save her avowed one of returning the quilting frames she had borrowed the preceding winter, it was an amiable weakness shared by most of the Avonlea people. Many a thing Mrs. Lynde has lent, sometimes never expecting to see it again, came home that night in charge of the borrowers thereof. A new minister and moreover a minister with a wife, was a lawful object of curiosity in a quiet little country settlement, where sensations were few and far between. Old Mr. Bentley, the minister whom Anne had found lacking in imagination, had been pastor of Avonlea for eighteen years. He was a widower when he came, and a widower he remained, despite the fact that gossip regularly married him to this, that, or the other one every year of his sojourn. In the preceding February he had resigned his charge and departed amid the regrets of his people, most of whom had the affection born of long intercourse for their good old minister in spite of his shortcomings as an orator. Since then the Avonlea Church had enjoyed a variety of religious dissipation in listening to the many and various candidates and supplies who came Sunday after Sunday to preach on trial. These stood or fell by the judgment of the fathers and mothers in Israel, but a certain small red-haired girl who sat meekly in the corner of the old Cuthbert pew also had her opinions about them and discussed the same in full with Matthew, Marilla always declining from principle to criticize ministers in any shape or form. "'I don't think Mr. Smith would have done, Matthew,' was Anne's final summing up. "'Mrs. Lynde said his delivery was so poor, but I think his worst fault was just like Mr. Bentley's. He had no imagination.' And Mr. Terry had too much. He let it run away with him, just as I did mine in the matter of the haunted wood. Besides, Mrs. Lynde said his theology wasn't sound. Mr. Gresham was a very good man, and a very religious man, but he told too many funny stories and made the people laugh in church. He was undignified, and you must have some dignity about a minister, mustn't you, Matthew? 
I thought Mr. Marshall was decidedly attractive, but Mrs. Lynn said he isn't married or even engaged because she made special inquiries about him, and she says it would never do to have a young unmarried minister in Avonlea because he might marry in the congregation and that would make trouble. Mrs. Lynn is a very far-seeing woman, isn't she, Matthew? I'm very glad they called Mr. Allen. I liked him because his sermon was interesting, and he prayed as if he meant it, and not just as if he did it because he was in the habit of it. Mrs. Lynn said he isn't perfect, but she said she supposes we couldn't expect a perfect minister for $750 a year, and anyhow, his theology is sound because she questioned him thoroughly on all the points of doctrine, and she knows his wife's people, and they are most respectable, and the women are all good housekeepers. Mrs. Lynn said that sound doctrine in the man and good housekeeping in the woman make an ideal combination for a minister's family. The new minister and his wife were a young, pleasant-faced couple, still on their honeymoon, and full of all good and beautiful enthusiasms for their chosen life work. Avonlea opened its heart to them from the start. Old and young liked the frank, cheerful young man with his high ideals, and the bright, gentle little lady who assumed the mistress-ship of the manse. With Mrs. Allen, Anne fell promptly and wholeheartedly in love. She had discovered another kindred spirit. "'Mrs. Allen is perfectly lovely,' she announced one Sunday afternoon. "'She's taken our class, and she's a splendid teacher. "'She said right away she didn't think it was fair for the teacher to ask all the questions. "'And you know, Marilla, that is exactly what I've always thought. "'She said we could ask her any question we liked, and I asked ever so many. "'I'm good at asking questions, Marilla.' "'I believe you,' was Marilla's emphatic comment." Nobody else asked any except Ruby Gillis, and she asked if there was to be a Sunday school picnic this summer. I didn't think that was a very proper question to ask, because it hadn't any connection with the lesson. The lesson was about Daniel in the lion's den. But Mrs. Allen just smiled and said she thought there would be. Mrs. Allen has a lovely smile. She has such exquisite dimples in her cheeks. I wish I had dimples in my cheeks, Marilla. I'm not half so skinny as I was when I came here, but I have no dimples yet. If I had, perhaps I could influence people for good. Mrs. Allen said we ought always to try to influence other people for good. She talked so nice about everything. I never knew before that religion was such a cheerful thing. I always thought it was kind of melancholy. But Mrs. Allen's isn't, and I'd like to be a Christian if I could be one like her. I wouldn't want to be one like Mr. Superintendent Bell. It's very naughty of you to speak so about Mr. Bell, said Marilla severely. Mr. Bell is a real good man. "'Well, of course he's good,' agreed Anne. "'But he doesn't seem to get any comfort out of it. "'If I could be good, I'd dance and sing all day because I was glad of it. "'I suppose Mrs. Allen is too old to dance and sing, "'and of course it wouldn't be dignified in a minister's wife, "'but I can just feel she's glad she's a Christian "'and that she'd be one even if she could get to heaven without it.' "'I suppose we must have Mr. and Mrs. Allen up to tea some day soon,' "'said Marilla reflectively. "'They've been most everywhere but here. Let's see.' Next Wednesday would be a good time to have them. Don't say a word to Matthew about it, for if he knew they were coming, he'd find some excuse to be away that day. He got so used to Mr. Bentley, he didn't mind him, but he's going to find it hard to get acquainted with a new minister, and a new minister's wife will frighten him to death. I'll be as secret as the dead, assured Anne. But, oh, Marilla, will you let me make a cake for the occasion? I'd love to do something for Mrs. Allen, and you know I can make a pretty good cake by this time. You can make a layer cake promised Marilla. Monday and Tuesday, great preparations went on at Green Gables. Having the minister and his wife to tea was a serious and important undertaking, and Marilla was determined not to be eclipsed by any of the Avonlea housekeepers. Anne was wild with excitement and delight. She talked it all over with Diana Tuesday night in the twilight, as they sat on the big red stones by the dryad's bubble and made rainbows in the water with little twigs dipped in fir balsam. "'Everything is ready, Diana, except my cake, which I'm to make in the morning, "'and the baking powder biscuits, which Marilla will make just before tea time. "'I assure you, Diana, that Marilla and I have had a busy two days of it. "'It's such a responsibility having a minister's family to tea. "'I never went through such an experience before. "'You should just see our pantry. It's a sight to behold. "'We're going to have jellied chicken and cold tongue. "'We're to have two kinds of jelly, red and yellow, and whipped cream and lemon pie, 
and cherry pie and three kinds of cookies and fruitcake and Marilla's famous yellow plum preserves that she keeps especially for ministers and pound cake and layer cake and biscuits as aforesaid and new bread and old both in case the minister is dyspeptic and can't eat new. M Mrs. Lynde said ministers are dyspeptic, but I don't think Mr. Allen has been a minister long enough for it to have had a bad effect on him. I just grow cold when I think of my layer cake. Oh, Diana, what if it shouldn't be good? I dreamt last night that I was chased all around by a fearful goblin with a big layer cake for a head. It'll be good, all right, assured Diana, who was a very comfortable sort of friend. I'm sure that piece of the one you made that we had for lunch in Idlewild two weeks ago was perfectly elegant. Yes, but cakes have such a terrible habit of turning out bad just when you especially want them to be good, sighed Anne setting a particularly well-balsam twig afloat. However, I shall just have to trust to Providence and be careful to put in the flower. Oh, look, Diana, what a lovely rainbow. Do you suppose the dryad will come out after we go away and take it for a scarf? You know there's no such thing as a dryad, said Diana. Diana's mother had found out about the haunted wood and had been decidedly angry over it. As a result, Diana had abstained from any further imitative flights of imagination, and did not think it prudent to cultivate a spirit of belief even in harmless dryads. "'But it's so easy to imagine there is,' said Anne. "'Every night before I go to bed I look out of my window and wonder if the dryad is really sitting here, combing her locks with a spring for a mirror. Sometimes I look for her footprints in the dew in the morning. Oh, Diana!' Don't give up your faith in the dryad. Wednesday morning came. Anne got up at sunrise because she was too excited to sleep. She had caught a severe cold in the head by reason of her dabbling in the spring on the preceding evening, but nothing short of absolute pneumonia could have quenched her interest in culinary matters that morning. After breakfast, she proceeded to make her cake. When she finally shut the oven door upon it, she drew a long breath. I'm sure I haven't forgotten anything this time, Marilla. But do you think it will rise? To suppose perhaps the baking powder isn't good. I used it out of the new can. And Mrs. Lynde said you can never be sure of getting good baking powder nowadays when everything is so adulterated. Mrs. Lynde said the government ought to take the matter up, but she says we'll never see the day when a Tory government will do it. Marilla, what if the cake doesn't rise? We'll have plenty without it, was Marilla's unimpassioned way of looking at the subject. The cake did rise, however, and came out of the oven as light and feathery as golden foam. Anne, flushed with delight, clapped it together with layers of ruby jelly, and in imagination saw Mrs. Allen eating it, and possibly asking for another piece. "'You'll be using the best tea set, of course, Marilla,' she said. "'Can I fix the table with ferns and wild roses?' "'I think that's all nonsense.' sniffed Marilla. In my opinion, it's the eatables that matter and not flummery decorations. Mrs. Barry had her table decorated, said Anne, who was not entirely guiltless of the wisdom of the serpent. And the minister paid her an elegant compliment. He said it was a feast for the eye as well as the palate. Well, do as you like, said Marilla, who was quite determined not to be surpassed by Mrs. Barry or anybody else. Only mind you leave enough room for the dishes and the food. Anne laid herself out to decorate in a manner and after a fashion that should leave Mrs. Barry's nowhere. Having abundance of roses and ferns and a very artistic taste of her own, she made that tea table such a thing of beauty that when the minister and his wife sat down to it, they exclaimed in chorus over its loveliness. "'It's Anne's doings,' said Marilla, grimly just, and Anne felt that Mrs. Allen's approving smile was almost too much happiness for this world." Matthew was there, having been inveigled into the party only goodness and Anne knew how. He had been in such a state of shyness and nervousness that Marilla had given him up in despair, but Anne took him in hand so successfully that he now sat at the table in his best clothes and white collar and talked to the minister not uninterestingly. He never said a word to Mrs. Allen, but that was perhaps not to be expected. All went merry as a marriage bell until Anne's layer cake was passed. Mrs. Allen, having already been helped to a bewildering variety, declined it. But Marilla, seeing the disappointment on Anne's face, said smilingly, "'Oh, you must take a piece of this, Mrs. Allen. Anne made it on purpose for you.' 
In that case, I must sample it, laughed Mrs. Allen, helping herself to a plump triangle, as did also the minister and Marilla. Mrs. Allen took a mouthful of hers, and a most peculiar expression crossed her face. Not a word did she say, however, but steadily ate away at it. Marilla saw the expression and hastened to taste the cake. "'Anne Shirley!' she exclaimed. "'What on earth did you put into that cake?' "'Nothing but what the recipe said, Marilla!' cried Anne with a look of anguish. "'Oh, isn't it all right?' "'All right? It's simply horrible! Mr. Allen, don't try to eat it. Anne, taste it yourself. What flavoring did you use?' "'Vanilla?' said Anne, her face scarlet with mortification after tasting the cake. "'Only vanilla?' "'Oh, Marilla, it must have been the baking powder. "'I had my suspicions of that big... "'Baking powder fiddlesticks. "'Go and bring me the bottle of vanilla you used.' "'Anne fled to the pantry and returned with a small bottle "'partially filled with a brown liquid "'and labeled yellowly, Best Vanilla. "'Marilla took it, uncorked it, and smelled it. "'Mercy on us, Anne, you flavored that cake with anodyne liniment!' I broke the liniment bottle last week and poured what was left into an old empty vanilla bottle. I suppose it's partly my fault. I should have warned you. But for pity's sake, why couldn't you have smelled it? Anne dissolved into tears under this double disgrace. I couldn't. I had such a cold. And with this, she fairly fled to the gable chamber where she cast herself on the bed and wept as one who refuses to be comforted. Presently, a light step sounded on the stairs, and somebody entered the room. "'Oh, Marilla,' sobbed Anne, without looking up. "'I'm disgraced forever. I shall never be able to live this down. It will get out. Things always do get out in Avonlea. Diana will ask me how my cake turned out, and I shall have to tell her the truth, and I shall always be pointed at as the girl who flavored a cake with anodyne liniment. Gil the boys in school will never get over laughing at it. Oh, Marilla, if you have a spark of Christian pity, don't tell me I must go down and wash the dishes after this. I I'll wash them when the minister and his wife are gone, but I cannot ever look Mrs. Allen in the face again. Perhaps she'll think I tried to poison her. Mrs. Lynn said she knows an orphan girl who tried to poison her benefactor. But the liniment isn't poisonous. It's meant to be taken internally, although not in cakes. Won't you tell Mrs. Allen so, Marilla? Suppose you jump up and tell her so yourself, said a merry voice. Anne flew up to find Mrs. Allen standing by her bed, surveying her with laughing eyes. My dear little girl, you mustn't cry like this she said, genuinely disturbed by Anne's tragic face. Why, it's all just a funny mistake that anybody might make. Oh, no, it takes me to make such a mistake, said Anne forlornly. And I wanted to have that cake so nice for you, Mrs. Allen. Yes, I know, dear, and I assure you I appreciate your kindness and thoughtfulness just as much as if it had turned out all right. Now, you mustn't cry any more, but come down with me and show me your flower garden. Miss Cuthbert tells me you have a little plot all your own. I want to see it, for I am very much interested in flowers. Anne permitted herself to be led down and comforted, reflecting that it was really providential that Mrs. Allen was a kindred spirit. Nothing more was said about the liniment cake, and when the guests went away, Anne found that she had enjoyed the evening more than could have been expected, considering that terrible incident. Nevertheless, she sighed deeply. Oh, Marilla, isn't it nice to think that tomorrow is a new day with no mistakes in it yet? I'll warrant you you'll make plenty in it, said Marilla. I never saw your beat for making mistakes, Anne. Yes, and well I know it, admitted Anne mournfully. But have you ever noticed one encouraging thing about me, Marilla? I never make the same mistake twice. I don't know as that's much benefit when you're always making new ones. Oh, don't you see, Marilla? There must be a limit to the mistakes one person can make, and when I get to the end of them, then I'll be through with them. That's a very comforting thought. Well, you better go and give that cake to the pigs, said Marilla. It isn't fit for any human to eat. Not even Jerry be it. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 Anne is invited out to tea. 
"'And what are your eyes popping out of your head about now?' asked Marilla, when Anne had just come in from a run to the post office. "'Have you discovered another kindred spirit?' Excitement hung around Anne like a garment, shone in her eyes, kindled in every feature. She had come dancing up the lane like a wind-blown sprite through the mellow sunshine and lazy shadows of the August evening.' "'No, Marilla, but, oh, what do you think? "'I'm invited to tea at the manse tomorrow afternoon. "'Mrs. Allen left the letter for me at the post office. "'Just look at it, Marilla. "'Miss Anne Shirley, Green Gables. "'This is the first time I was ever called Miss. "'Such a thrill as it gave me. "'I shall cherish it forever amongst my choicest treasures.' "'Mrs. Allen told me she meant to have all the members of her Sunday school class to tea in turn,' said Marilla, regarding the wonderful event very coolly. "'You needn't get into such a fever over it. Do learn to take things calmly, child.' For Anne to take things calmly would have been to change her nature, all spirit and fire and dew as she was. The pleasures and pains of life came to her with trebled intensity. Marilla felt this, and was vaguely troubled over it, realizing that the ups and downs of existence would probably bear hardly on this impulsive soul, and not sufficiently understanding that the equally great capacity for delight might more than compensate. Therefore Marilla conceived it to be her duty to drill Anne into a tranquil uniformity of disposition as impossible and alien to her as to a dancing sunbeam in one of the brook shallows. She did not make much headway, as she sorrowfully admitted to herself. The downfall of some dear hope or plan plunged Anne into deeps of affliction. The fulfillment thereof exalted her to dizzying realms of delight. Marilla had almost begun to despair of ever fashioning this waif of the world into her model little girl of demure manners and prim deportment. Neither would she have believed that she really liked Anne much better as she was. Anne went to bed that night speechless with misery, because Matthew had said the wind was round northeast and he feared it would be a rainy day tomorrow. The rustle of the poplar leaves about the house worried her. It sounded so like pattering raindrops, and the full faraway roar of the gulf, to which she listened delightedly at other times, loving its strange, sonorous, haunting rhythm, now seemed like a prophecy of storm and disaster to a small maiden who particularly wanted a fine day. Anne thought that the morning would never come. But all things have an end even nights before the day on which you are invited to take tea at the manse. The morning, in spite of Matthew's predictions, was fine, and Anne's spirits soared to their highest. Oh, Marilla, there is something in me today that makes me just love everybody I see, she exclaimed as she washed the breakfast dishes. You don't know how good I feel. Wouldn't it be nice if it could last? I believe I could be a model child if I were just invited out to tea every day. But, oh, Marilla, it's a solemn occasion, too. I feel so anxious. What if I shouldn't behave properly? You know I've never had tea at a manse before, and I'm not sure that I know all the rules of etiquette, although I've been studying the rules given in the etiquette department of the Family Herald ever since I came here. I'm so afraid I'll do something silly or forget to do something I should do. Would it be good manners to take a second helping of anything if you wanted to very much? The trouble with you, Anne, is that you're thinking too much about yourself. You should just think of Mrs. Allen and what will be nicest and most agreeable to her, said Marilla, hitting for once in her life on a very sound and pithy piece of advice. Anne instantly realized this. You're right, Marilla. I'll try not to think about myself at all. Anne evidently got through her visit without any serious breach of etiquette, for she came home through the twilight under a great high-sprung sky gloried over with trails of saffron and rosy cloud, in a beatified state of mind, and told Marilla all about it happily, sitting on the big red sandstone slab at the kitchen door with her tired curly head in Marilla's gingham lap. A cool wind was blowing down over the long harvest fields, from the rims of furry westered hills and whistling through the poplars. One clear star hung over the orchard, and the fireflies were flitting over in Lover's Lane, in and out among the ferns and rustling boughs. Anne watched them as she talked, and somehow felt that wind and stars and fireflies were all tangled up together into something 
unutterably sweet and enchanting. Oh, Marilla, I've had the most fascinating time. I feel that I have not lived in vain, and I shall always feel like that, even if I should never be invited to tea at a manse again. When I got there, Mrs. Allen met me at the door. She was dressed in the sweetest dress of pale pink organdy with dozens of frills and elbow sleeves, and she looked just like a seraph. I really think I'd like to be a minister's wife when I grow up, Marilla. A minister mightn't mind my red hair, because he wouldn't be thinking of such worldly things. But then, of course, one would have to be naturally good, and I'll never be that, so I suppose there's no use in thinking about it. Some people are naturally good, you know, and others are not. I'm one of the others. Mrs. Lynde said I'm full of original sin. No matter how hard I try to be good, I can never make such a success of it as those who are naturally good. It's a good deal like geometry, I expect. But don't you think that trying so hard ought to count for something? Mrs. Allen is one of the naturally good people. I love her passionately. You know there are some people, like Matthew and Mrs. Allen, that you could love right off without any trouble. And there are others, like Mrs. Lynde, that you have to try very hard to love. You know you ought to love them because they know so much and are such active workers in the church, but you have to keep reminding yourself of it all the time or else you forget. There was another little girl at the manse to tea from the White Sands Sunday School. Her name was Lorette Bradley, and she was a very nice little girl. Not exactly a kindred spirit, you know, but still very nice. We had an elegant tea, and I think I kept all the rules of etiquette pretty well. After tea, Mrs. Allen played and sang, and she got Loretta and me to sing, too. Mrs. Allen said I have a good voice, and she said I must sing in the Sunday school choir after this. You can't think how I was thrilled at the mere thought. I have longed so to sing in the Sunday school choir as Diana does, but I feared it was an honor I could never aspire to. Loretta had to go home early because there's a big concert in the White Sands Hotel tonight, and her sister is to recite at it. Loretta said the Americans at the hotel give a concert every fortnight in aid of the Charlottetown Hospital, and they ask lots of the White Sands people to recite. Loretta said she expected to be asked herself some day. I just gazed at her in awe. After she had gone, Mrs. Allen and I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk. I told her everything about Mrs. Thomas and the twins and Katie Morris and Violetta and coming to Green Gables and my troubles over geometry. And would you believe it, Marilla? Mrs. Allen told me she was a dunce at geometry, too. You don't know how that encouraged me. Mrs. Lynde came to the manse just before I left, and what do you think, Marilla? The trustees have hired a new teacher, and it's a lady. Her name is Miss Muriel Stacy. Isn't that a romantic name? Mrs. Lynde said they'd never had a female teacher in Avonlea before, and she thinks it's a dangerous innovation. But I think it will be splendid to have a lady teacher, and I really don't see how I'm going to live through the two weeks before school begins. I'm so impatient to see her. End of chapter 22. Okay, there is a line that we heard in, in this episode, in these chapters, that comes from the book The History of Tom Jones, A Foundling, by Henry Fielding. And the line made me laugh when I saw that it was a reference to Tom Jones, because I thought it meant even more than it seems to mean. And that line is amiable weakness. But I wanted to read for you the text from which amiable weakness is taken. And it is, When he was departed, his sister expressed more bitterness, if possible, against him than she had done when he was present, for the truth of which she appealed to Mr. Bliffle, who, with great complacence, acquiesced entirely in all she said, but excused all the faults of Mr. Western, quote, as they must be considered, he said, to have proceeded from the too inordinate fondness of a father, which must be allowed the name of an amiable weakness. So much the more inexcusable, answered the lady, for whom doth he ruin by his fondness but his own child? To which Mr. Bliffle immediately agreed. So an amiable weakness, a father's weakness in spoiling his child, doesn't create such an amiable product. And for us, the amiable weakness that was referred to was from here. If Marilla, in going down to Mrs. Lynde's that evening, was actuated by any motive save her avowed one of returning the quilting frame that she had borrowed the preceding winter, it was an amiable weakness shared by most of the Avonlea people. So they were all indulging their need for gossip. And 
It's kind of a funny way to say it. Also, as we were listening to chapter 21, did you notice the enormous spread that Marilla was putting out for the minister's wife? The minister and his wife. Cokie smokes. Woman can cook. And she's totally showing off by doing it. But man, she's, she's no joke. And then to have Mrs. Lynn complaining to Anne, of all people, how everything is adulterated now, so you can't even trust baking powder. I thought, oh, maybe I'm going to start using that. <laughs> you can't even trust your baking powder anymore. If the line, Mary as a marriage bell, sounded like a quote, it is. It's from Child Harold's Pilgrimage by Lord Byron, and the original line is, There was a sound of revelry by night, and all went merry as a marriage bell. But hush, hark, a deep sound strikes, like a rising knell. That doomy kind of ending to the Lord Byron line is also implied here, because here we have all went merry as a marriage bell until Anne's layer cake was passed. Dun, 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 dun. So that's why Lucy Maud Montgomery used that line. And then in regards to the cake, this actually happened to her. <laughs> she wrote in one of her journals, The notable incident of the liniment cake happened when I was teaching school in Bidford and boarding at the Metho Methodist parsonage there. Its charming mistress flavored a layer cake with anodyne liniment one day. Never shall I forget the taste of that cake, and the fun that we had over it, for the mistake was not discovered until tea time. A strange minister was there to tea that night. He ate every crumb of his piece of cake. What he thought of it we never discovered. Possibly he imagined it was simply some newfangled flavoring. But holy cow, that had to be one nasty tasting cake. Wow. <sighs> she has a stronger stomach and constitution, and more forgiving than I think I would be after a mouthful of Bengay. But once again, Anne is totally broadsided, poor thing, by somebody else messing something up. First, Miss Berry doesn't tell them that the aunt is in the spare room and they get in trouble for jumping on her. Now Marilla forgets to tell Anne what's going on with the cake. We had the cherry cordial with oh, this poor kid. It's not her fault. She gets busted for all of it, and it's not her fault. <sighs> so, <sighs> I guess we have to let it pass because at the end of chapter 22, well, the beginning of chapter 20, middle of chapter 22, Anne comes home, and what does she do? She puts her curly head in Marilla's gingham lap, and Marilla talks to her and listens to what her afternoon was like, just like, like a mom, like it's normal. And Lucy Maud Montgomery does not belabor this point at all, but it very, very clearly happens. And how awesome for Anne to finally have that kind of soothing presence in her life. Marilla might not be one who's really demonstrative and lovey-dovey and, you know, hugging and kissing her all the time, but this moment is so tender and so quiet. I just thought it was great. Also, in case you were wondering, a female teacher as a dangerous innovation, I'm sure that Mrs. Lynde was not the only one who thought that way. It probably isn't much of a sign of Avonlea being really progressive or anything like that. It's probably just that it was such a small community that it didn't merit the importance of having a man posted there. This is something that we've seen off and on forever. So... Yeah, they're probably not out at the forefront. It was, wasn't one of Lucy Maud Montgomery's here. Let me comment on this by demonstrating kind of in a show-not-tell way that Avonlea's ahead of the game. Probably not. And that's it. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great week. I will talk to you soon with more Anne of Green Gables. Have a great one. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.